So we are at the Inspiration House, your newest, most awesome project. I'm pretty excited about it. And we're talking about all the things today. Pretty much everything, yeah. And yeah. I've done a lot of on-screen lectures with you. So whenever I put together all the lists of things that we wanted to talk about, it was hard for me to find a topic for me to talk to you about of things that I had not yet talked to you about. That's entirely fair. But what I think is relevant in today's culture is digital shielding. Which is a huge challenge. Like, so everybody I know who's sensitive at all and has any kind of social media presence, which is just about everybody these days, goes online and like it's it's a crap shoot. Do I go and get the happy puppy pictures on my Instagram and my Twitter, or is it just a world of terrible things? And it's not just like the the greater world stuff, but like it just seems like there's so much negativity, so many things that are going wrong. And if you are a compassionate person, um, and, and especially if you are an empathetic person, like if you can start to feel some of that, like it's very easily overwhelming. I mean, I get overwhelmed with it, and I'm, I've been doing this for a long, long time. Uh, so, so how do you protect yourself? Um, because there's there's a level of emotional exhaustion, and you know, ramp that up to a specially high level if you are also psychic and tuning into just the anxiety and misery and the fear um, and you know the, the very real worry about the state of the world and, and safety and, and so many things. So, so what do you do? I mean, one, one of the first things is, is I take fasts from the internet. I have to um, because as, as someone with the abilities that I have, if I'm paying attention to what's going on in people's lives, I kind of naturally start to reach out and connect to them on a psychic level. And some days that's just too much. Uh, so you have to set times aside where you just take some time for you and detach. It's essential to detach from it and take, take a fast from any kind of online stuff. Um, I know that for people who do business with their emails or things or who have to have an online presence, that can be very difficult. But setting a couple of days aside, or even just a weekend that you just take to yourself, think about how fast-paced life must be now, where it's instant response to everything, and we're just bombarded. Psychic stuff aside, that's overwhelming. And, and we're, we're still culturally developing ways of trying to cope with it, and we haven't yet, not in any good way. Take some time to detach, take some time to, to engage in self-care, do anything that helps you focus on something else. And then that's probably the most important thing for me. I game. The reason I will spend like a week just gaming is so that I can shut those little tendrils in my brain down and focus them at something that is completely inane so that I'm not just riding these waves of like cultural angst that are coming in from the collective unconscious. Mm -hmm. So detach, go through the process of like don't put the phone somewhere else, put it in a different room, um, shut the computer off, go for a walk, do something that is not digital or electronic. Don't watch TV. Um, do anything that's going to keep you away from turning your attention back to that stuff. Because again, if you're psychic, once your attention goes back to it, you're going to start tuning into those emotions and you can easily get overwhelmed. So walk me through the visualizations. So sometimes you'll encounter an internet troll, mm. just some rude person that wants to make your life a living hell. There's a lot of those. Mm -hmm. And it's essentially, for me, it will feel like a psychic attack. Mm -hmm. It feels exactly the same to me. And so walk me through the visualizations that you would use in a regular psychic attack and how they apply to the digital world. Okay, so with a regular psychic attack, say first you identify like, almost always somebody who's attacking you. If it's a person, they are someone who has just interacted with you or has recently interacted with you. Usually that means they're in the same room with you. And so your first thing is to remove yourself from that room because typically, and, and there are always exceptions to this rule, but typically the person attacking you is doing it because they can see you. Something about you has drawn their attention. How does that connect to like an internet troll? No. 
you've you've drawn their attention. You know, this is somebody who has nothing better in their life but to like go through people's web pages. They might not be interested in it at all. They just get their jollies out of finding what they consider weak targets to to attack. And it is an attack. It's 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 an aggressive thing, usually from someone who is powerless in their real life. This is the only way they can feel like they have some control. They are almost always horribly miserable, nasty-minded people. Um, and keeping that in mind, like that this is coming from a place of rage and anger and impotence. And from a psychic perspective, focusing on that impotence and just sending it right back at them. <laughs> okay, so uh, was it called offense? Yeah, offense. Yeah. Um, I, it's really the best defense with stuff like that. Like, it, if you feel like there is, that there are emotions coming to you, that there's, you know, negative energy, whatever, like, don't, the practical side of it first is don't engage. Mm -hmm. Don't feed the troll. It's, it's an internet truism. Don't discount the troll. Because, as we have learned, some people who make threats on the internet do carry them out. Mm -hmm. um, so if there is anything that they have done or said that is illegal, um, and there is a way to report it, you should report it. And at the very least, absolutely keep records of it. Get screen caps of it and file those records away so that if things escalate, you, you have a paper trail. So, so that's the practical side of it. Um, don't give in to the desire to like yell at them, make fun of them, say anything back, completely ignore them because what they want is attention. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, what you want to do is give them no attention. You block them, you mute them, and then psychically you put them in what I call a hamster ball. Because <laughs> I had a hamster as a kid, and this stupid little rodent would just roll around in its hamster ball and piss and shit in the hamster ball, and just keep rolling around in its piss and its shit, and get covered in it, because it couldn't go anywhere. And it occurred to me that that was the best thing to do to people who put that much kind of crap into the world, Mm -hmm. is don't shield yourself from them because they're just going to attack somebody else. If you can do it, shield them so that all of their stuff stays with them. Mm -hmm. um, I usually put a clause on it of, you know, when they stop pissing and shitting everywhere, they can, they can let out, like, like if they are actually going to be functional, reasonable human beings, but otherwise put them in solitary confinement um, or just reflect back at them. Um, you know, do do your shielding, but make that shielding an aggressive shield, where anything that they're throwing at you, you're sending right back at. Um, a more a more complicated um, technique, and it's one that that I've used and I use well. Eat it. <laughs> I mean, like it's energy, and it may suck, um, but if you can pull the emotions away from it and just use what they've thrown at you and take all of their hate or rage and all of the ways that they have tried to make you feel little and ugly and horrible and just use that to shine. <laughs> Success is the best vengeance. So a lot of the stuff that you teach, it's visualization based. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed a lot because I do meet young psychics now, people who want help. I've noticed that there's a strong intersection between the psychological and the psychic, obviously. It all happens in your brain. And I'm interested in this because at Madison, people will come, and it depends on the person what they pick up on. Yeah. So I know an eight-year-old that always sees a ghost that he calls grandpa, and he thinks he's cute and fun and playful. But somebody else can come into the building and it's like they bring their own baggage mm -hmm. and they experience a very scary haunting. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in that intersection and I wanted to know your thoughts on that. <sighs> well, there, there's complicated layers to that. Um, I think Lorraine Warren would say that it's laws of attraction and it's that almost oversimplifies it. Um, you cannot remove the psyche from psychic experience. Um, it's happening in your mind, and it's, it's not merely that there's like all in your head, but your mind is this vast and complicated territory. You have got your conscious mind, and it is only a small portion of what's going on in there for every single person. Um, the architecture of your mind is built by the language 
that you that you first learn to speak. But more than that language, it is every cultural association you have been steeped in from birth, every book you have read, every movie you have seen, every story you've heard, every interaction that you, you've engaged in to play with people. So a lot of like how we experience stuff, and one of the reasons why like it, some, some of the, the ghost stories from East to West, or from our time period to ancient time periods, some of the reasons they look so very different is that people experience them differently because we are filtering all of our experiences through this lens, and that lens is colored by here and now and who we are. So if you're going to a haunting, and I've, I've always watched this happen with hauntings, if you go in wanting to be scared or expecting to be scared, those are the things that you're going to pay more attention to. It's, it's not even that you're going to attract them. You will. You, you will be putting out that energy. So on one hand, you will be attracting more of that stuff, but also you will be more inclined to only look for things that will scare you. Um, it's actually a psychic version of Hapgood's Law. Uh, Charles Hapgood, he wrote maps of the ancient sea kings, but more than that, um, he's known for Hapgood's Law, which it's a, it's a simple law of science. It's so simple, it sounds dumb when you hear it. In science, you only find what you're looking for. Think about just having blood drawn. Um, when a doctor or orders a blood draw, they're usually looking for a specific thing. So they order a specific test to look for that specific thing. If they don't order the test for thyroid T1 and T2, mm -hmm. they're not going to get the results that tell them anything about that because there's actually too many things to test and too many things to know. The same holds true in the paranormal with all of our experiences for our psychic stuff. There are, like a place like Madison, there are so many things going on there. So when you go and you're only looking for this, it also automatically means that you are, you are excluding all of these other things. You don't even have to be excluding it consciously. Your focus is just here. Automatically that means you don't see these things. Maybe if something over here is super loud, it'll catch your attention, but for the most part you have already biased yourself. You have essentially front-loaded yourself. Mm -hmm. um, on another level, if you go in in a certain emotional mood, if you're just having a really crappy day, uh, if you go in angry, you're going to be more likely to pick up on, pay attention to, and have a resonance with other things that are angry. Hmm. Um, and, and that's just psychology. It's one reason why, um, especially for psychics, it's important to like do the grounding, centering, shielding, to get into a place where you are centered and calm and you have neither expectation of success nor fear of failure. Um, and, and you try to be as neutral and open as possible so that what comes through is what needs to come through as opposed to what you're unconsciously looking for, either to perpetuate your own initial mood, um, your own uh, validate your initial expectations or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So you only find what you're looking for. Whenever you have a public persona, mm -hmm. you gain a reputation as a psychic, right? People start to ask you this question, do you do readings? Oh my God, yeah. And my answer has become a resounding, hell no, I don't. Because I feel like you have too much responsibility and there are too many, too many factors. But I wanted to hear, if I were a regular person and I came up to you and I okay. said, do you do readings? I'd like to hear your answer because I know what mine is. I do not do readings for hire. Um, and I don't do traditional psychic readings any which way. Um, actually, most of my life is spent trying not to read every single person around me all the time. And I still manage to pick stuff out of people's head all the time. And it's just grossly impolite. <laughs> <laughs> the main reason I don't, because that, that's, the, that's the second part of that question. Well, why not? Mm -hmm. There are people who do that for a living. They are legitimate. They are legitimate people, and they are being paid for their time. I cannot comfortably put a price on it. Mm -hmm. And and for me, it's it's a personal level of comfortability. Mm -hmm. And some of that is, if somebody comes to me and pays me seventy dollars for a reading, um, and I get nothing because sometimes I do. Mm -hmm. I still am going to feel like 
like, well, honestly, I'll feel like an asshole when I'm like, nope, sorry, got nothing, taking your money anyway. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've spent my time to try to read them. So if it's a fair exchange, I keep that money, but like I've given them nothing. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm keenly aware of that. Uh, but also there's that, um, the performance, the, the need to perform that inevitably becomes inherent in that monetary exchange. Mm -hmm. Suddenly it becomes a good and a service. And so they've given me money, so I must give them something in return. And to me, that's a slippery slope to trying so hard to get a reading that I accidentally make stuff up. Mm -hmm. There is one time and one time only, and it was an unpaid reading, that I, I said some stuff that was probable, but I didn't believe that it was a psychic perception. Mm -hmm. And it was someone who'd come to me about someone who had committed suicide, and I could tell that they were in such distress about it that I did the psychic equivalent of, they're there, everything will be fine. Um, and, you know, I, I tried to, to save my own conscience, to phrase it in a way where I was not making an absolute, but, like, I, I, I gave that person a, a takeaway of the person is okay mm -hmm. and not suffering. Um, and that was... A huge moral dilemma at the moment like I for weeks afterwards I'm like you know I technically didn't lie and I did do the right thing because it helped the person but it's, it's still like that conflict I can't I can't put myself in that conflict regularly it's, it's just not it doesn't work for me mm -hmm. um, the one type of reading that I will do frequently that for me feels categorically different from what most people are expecting with mm -hmm. a psychic reading um, it, are the energy body readings that I do, mm -hmm. where I'm reading how a person's energy flows and like where different problems, uh, you know, echo from physical to, to metaphysical. And I think the difference and why it's easier for me to do that is there is very w worthwhile practical advice that I can give the person after that. Like, even if I get like the barest reading from them, I can still give them some idea of, okay, here's what you can do to improve your energy. So it can become instructive mm -hmm. rather than, uh, God, the other problem with like, you know, your standard psychic reading is it's always like the same five questions. Like it's always about, you know, I'm down on my luck and my curse, you know, how do I make money? How do I get this job? Or, or love, like it's it's job and money, or it's love or lost loves, mm -hmm. or it's some family member, and it's almost always trauma. Mm -hmm. And it's almost always like so much needy stuff. And, and then the other thing is, is there are these repeat customers. Yes, that you become addictions. Their therapists. Yes. And mm -hmm. what they really need is an honest to goodness therapist. Yes. And they shouldn't be wasting their money on me. Right, yeah. Like I can give them a little bit of help, mm -hmm. but what they really truly need first is to fix the other problems before they come to me to validate their bad decisions. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, there's enough people that look for psychics that that's exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. And I will not participate in a broken system. Mm -hmm. I simply won't. Mm -hmm. I, I'm enabling at that point, so I won't. And it's just easier to say no to everybody. Mm -hmm.